So, ladies and gentlemen, can I uh, urge you and encourage you to take your seats for the final session? This is the final session, but it is by no means, it is the last session, but by no means the least uh, session. The title of our session is Collecting Holocaust Testimonies in Cultural Contexts, Institutions and Their Collections. And have we got some institutions for you this afternoon? And we've got representatives, very distinguished representatives from some of the world's major collections. Um, the Yad um, Vashem uh, in Jerusalem, the Imperial War Museum, the British Library, and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Our first speaker is uh, Ofer Lifshitz, and he's going to speak to us, I believe, from Israel. He's on Zoom, so hopefully you can see, see the screens. Um, he's a researcher and interviewer uh, in the gathering, the fragments, uh, part of the Yad Vashem archive. Uh, we're going to be very brisk today because um, I've been told we have to be out of this building by six o'clock, or six o'clock-ish anyway. Uh, otherwise, dire things happen and the, the people in the, in the portraits behind me come alive, that kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, we've all seen Ruddy Gore, I'm not going down there. So, let, without further in introduction, let's, let's get, uh, hand over to, to Ofer Lifshitz from Yad Vashem. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Um, can, yes? Anyone? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, great, great. Uh, if if you can't hear me, please holler, and hopefully I can, I can hear you across the Mediterranean. I'll do my best. Um, it looks so majestic uh, as everything associated with the UK uh, um, always is to us, and it's a great honor and a privilege. Um, and I apologize, uh, this, is, this is the week of, of uh, our um, uh, local Memorial Day, so we're on a tight schedule. So I'm going to, um, to have to make a run for it after I speak. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm sure you will have a fabulous time. Um, um, can you hear me? Because, um, yes, great, great. Okay, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Shalom Aleichem, chaverim vechaverot. My name is Ofer Lifshitz. As just introduced, I'm an interviewer for Yad Vashem, and it is a privilege to be talking to you about Yad Vashem's testimony collection. As the collection's lineage, so to speak, goes back to the Warsaw Ghetto. I'll talk about that a bit later on. It is all the more touching to be speaking to you about it today, just a day after we have noted 80 years to the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. I'll be focusing on collecting testimonies by Yad Vashem from the viewpoint of culture. One aspect of the cultural complexity that is associated with collecting testimony, the challenge of making room for the individual for the personal story vis-a-vis -vis collective influences, bearing in mind Yad Vashem's position in society. Actually, as we are discussing culture, it is already evident uh, in our choice of term for interviewing survivors, do we refer to such interviews as oral histories or testimonies? And what is the difference between the two terms? What undertones do they carry and what agendas do they imply? Um, as this is a Zoom talk, and we're talking about interviews and survivors, um, sorry, which are all about the human connection, I won't be using a PowerPoint. I'd like to be reading to you rather than reading at you, so please bear with me. Um, uh, just before we start, uh, here are the important facts about the, uh, Yad Vashem's testimony collection. It's ID, so to speak. Uh, Yad Vashem's testimony collection was founded in 1954, one of Yad Vashem's very first objects, uh, projects. It operates by law, based on statute. First audio formatted testimonies were recorded in the 1960s. Testimonies are being videotaped uh, by Yad Vashem since the 1990s and take place predominantly. Dominantly, the interview is home fiction, currently consists of 130,000 testimonies in over 20 languages. Um, are you still with me? <laughs> great. Uh, I'd like to start by quoting two great ladies, uh, both of whom are survivors. The first is Lena Kichler, the great educator, mother and author to, to my hundred children in Krakow and Zakopane. 
It was Lena's observation that a warm and soothing gaze is more effective than any method. The second is Elisheva van der Haal, a child survivor from the Netherlands who grew up to become a therapist treating other survivors. Each survivor, says Elisheva, carries a story with him or her and an ardent wish to have it told and heard. Following Elisheva and Lena, let's go back to basics. What is a testimony and what does it consist of? Well, three things, basically. One, a survivor tell his or her story. Two, we as the interviewers listen to the story. Three, we provide a certain sense of structure, trying to provide our interviewees with a supportive and enabling setting an empowering and reaffirming one, a test. Interviews with survivors or anyone for that matter are never conducted in isolation. What do I mean by referring to cultural and collective forces? To appreciate the complexity of the cultural context for interviewing survivors in Israeli society by Yad Vashem and the notions survivors and interviewers carry with them, let's break this down to four levels. Number one, there's society. Uh, the Holocaust is a major identity marker, as we all know, in Israeli society, one that people respond to regardless of whether they actually have personal or kin relations to survivors. A society where kapo and judenrat are terms that are an integral part of public discourse, familiar to everybody, not only the benefit of researchers. Plus, as I said, the testimony collection was founded in 1954 and the state of Israel only six years earlier, in 1948. So the collection's first and formative years coincided with Israel, Israel's and Israeli uh, identities first and formative years. Put differently, the testimony collection was founded and took its first steps just as Israeli identity was being constructed. The two are intertwined. On the second level, there's Yad Vashem, on behalf of which the interview is conducted and where for many years, interviews with survivors were actually being held. Yad Vashem has a role in society as the agency responsible for um, a Holocaust legacy. Then there's the third level, the interview itself, which is in a sense, a ritual of recognition in affirmation of the interviewee's survivorship. It is the mechanism through which the personal story is incorporated into collective memory. And at the heart of it all, there is the fourth and innermost uh, layer or level, the survivor. And notions of his or her role in society vis-a-vis -vis the role um, uh, of the state. The Holocaust playing a role in Israeli ethos, survivors carry with them notions and questions about their role in affirming Israel's ethos and raison d'etre. Then there are assumptions about the testimony. What should a witness be sharing with us and how? And there are questions of entitlement. And these are the most touching, speaking as an interviewer, because we often hear them from survivors prior to the interview. Should my story be heard? Should it receive attention? even if I had just run away or been hidden away rather than uh, being an, a camp inmate. None of these notions are conscious and deliberate, but we carry them with us as survivors and interviewers, and we respond to them. They pervade our interviews and challenge our ability to make room for the survivor's personal and individualized story. Now, let's see this with our very eyes. I'd like to go back to a moment in time that embodies these cultural inferences. And just a second, I'll be sharing my... Oh, okay. Sorry, um, I haven't asked for that earlier. Um, um, uh, uh, could I share my screen? Could you give me the permission? What a dramatic moment. What is he about to show us? Okay. 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 Uh, can you see the screen? <laughs> 
Okay. So just a second. Oh, wait. Uh, wait, sorry about that. I just want to make sure that I uh, included the, okay, I that I'm sharing the sound as well, or it would make no point. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen? Okay. Bo ani omed lifnechem shofte Israel. Belamed kategoria al Adolf Eichmann. En ani omed yuhidi. Sorry for stopping. Um, uh, can you hear? Can you hear the sound? Okay. We wouldn't be wanting to put Eichmann on mute. I madi nitzavim kan b'shah zo shisha million kategori. Achem lo yuchlu lakum al raglehem. Bishloach etzba marshia klapei taas kuchit velizok klapei hayoshef sham ani maashim. Mitnei she'aparam ne'aram ben giv'ot Auschwitz v'zdot Treblinka v'ishtak v'naharot polin v'kivrehem p'zurim al p'nei Europa la'orka v'lerohba Damam zo'ek Ach polam lo yishama Ye al ken ani lahem l'peh Okay. Um, quite a moment, a uh, very emotional and touching um, even today. Um, the Eichmann trial in 1961 marked a shift from telling the Holocaust as a collective story to sharing it as, as the story of individuals. Can you hear me? For the first time, survivors were called upon to share personal accounts of the Holocaust publicly. However, witnesses did so as a part of a collective act of indictment, which carried a very strong and marked collective undertone. Yet this is a formative moment, image and model that people in Israel carried with them for years. It has framed our notion of how survivor stories should be told and listened to. The Eichmann trial demonstrates Yad Vashem position in society as well. Rachel Auerbach, the founder and first director of the testimony collection, was the person in charge of putting together the witness list for the trial and was partner to its philosophy and design, the process of considering the witness's role. Joseph Melkman, CEO of Yad Vashem at the time, was one of the witnesses, as was Auerbach herself. And the witnesses present in, in, the, in the trial reveal something of her vision concerning the witnesses' role. A chance for survivors to actively share their own account as a part of a process of healing and revival, healing that has both a collective and a personal sense, as she referred to it, quote, to rise above the mass graves, unquote. What was Auerbach's vision? As was recently argued by Liora Bilski, testimony for Auerbach was a, quote, living archive, unquote. The survivor's way of countering victimization. It was the survivor's response to the perpetrator's account. In fact, Auerbach believed that the Eichmann trial should entirely be based on witnesses. Auerbach believed that survivors should be interviewed by survivors alone, and that survivor interviewers should indeed take an active role in eliciting memories. Auerbach was herself a survivor. She collected her first testimonies in the Warsaw Ghetto from Trubinka survivors as part of Emanuel Ringelblum's clandestine archive, Oneg Shabbat. Heading the Yad Vashem's Department of Testimony Collection for the first decade and a half of its operation, which was based on a team of survivor interviewers she assembled and trained as part of her staff, Yad Vashem's testimony collection was more than a documentation effort. It had a humanitarian and an existential vision as well. Just as the documentation efforts of Emanuel Ringelblum's Onik Shabbat, where Auerbach herself had been trained, were combined with humanitarian work. 
In her own testimony for the Eichmann trial, Auerbach focused on cultural life and spiritual resistance. Back in the 1960s, at this point in time, given the prevailing narratives about resistance and coping during the Holocaust, a full realization and appreciation of this aspect of Jewish life during the Holocaust had still been lacking in Israeli society, demonstrating the impact of narratives in circulation and of the zeitgeist. Moving forward in time, I'd Actually, like to sorry, share off, with... Off air, just to interrupt, I'm really sorry. Yeah. We have to wound, yeah. um, uh, wind up in a couple of minutes. Yeah, sure. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, I'm sorry. Um, uh, do I have five minutes? <laughs> I'll squeeze them. I'll squeeze five two, minutes into two. Two and a half, just speak quickly. Okay. Okay. So I'll let... I'll let um, um, Time flies when, you're discussing, when one discusses testimonies. Um, so I'll just, um, okay. I'll end with uh, the part I was playing to show you for, uh, from one of our recent testimonies, which was also fared and interviewed by the AJR. I mean, it's a survivor who is um, a British Empire medalist for his educational activities, Manfred Goldberg, uh, who is also, um, a Holocaust survivor, and I wanted to um, use this moment in order to demonstrate how Auerbach's vision of giving room for survivors to speak their story and, 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 and uh, make their sound be heard, um, how this vision um, was made possible through singing uh, in the, in the um, uh, testimony that I'm just about to show. Um, uh, which demonstrates also the, pr the processes that Yad Vashem's collection and got, had gone through, processes of moving uh, to interviewing um, survivors in their home setting, of listening to the entire um, uh, life story rather than just focusing on the Holocaust, um, and, and giving room to the small moments. Um, so in conclusion, um, I'll just I'll let you hear uh, dear Manfred. And uh, the haftarah, the biblical portion which he sings, which we'll be hearing just a few seconds from, was sung by him in, at the Riga Ghetto in 1943. That was his bar mitzvah. And he repeated that in his testimony. Can you see Manfred? Ah, <laughs> Thank you for listening and joining me on this small journey between the collective and personal in the context of interviewing survivors. I hope you learn and benefit from the conference and send you warm wishes and regards from Israel. May you be blessed for your important work uh, documenting human stories across communities and cultures and making sure they are listened to and remembered. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ofer, and I'm really sorry to have to hurry you, but uh, we, don't, sure. we don't want a Lancaster House lock-in. Um, <laughs> maybe we do, I don't know. <laughs> um, our next speaker is uh, James Bulgin. He's the head of public history at the Imperial War Museum, and uh, I'll just hand straight over to James. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to mention that, because it's come up a few times today, the Oneg Shabbat archive uh, has obviously been mentioned. One of the boxes from that archive is on display in the new galleries at the museum and is our most 
valued and important objects on loan from the Jewish Historical Institute. And I'll talk about why that's so important, but, but it's really to do with uh, whose perspective we're trying to engage within the galleries, and of course that's very pertinent to this issue of testimony. So I'm going to talk a little bit about IWM's work, both contemporarily and historically relating to testimony, before focusing on how we used film testimony in the new Holocaust galleries at the museum. I wanted to start with a caveat, though. I'm a user of testimony rather than a, rather than a creator or custodian of it. All information that follows about IWM's testimony archive has been passed on to me by my colleagues in the relevant departments. My own working knowledge of testimony in the museum has been exclusively through my role leading the creation of the new Holocaust galleries. I should also make one further distinction too. When I talk about testimony used in the Holocaust galleries, I'm referring to the filmed interviews that were created in the 1990s specifically for the former Holocaust exhibition. These are, however, to the best of my knowledge, the only filmed testimony interviews previously commissioned by the museum. All other testimonies in the museum have been recorded exclusively as oral histories. So starting with some background. The Department of Sound Records was established in 1972 as an offspring of the museum's library. In October 2010, the then named Sound Archive was merged with the Department of Documents to form the Documents and Sound section. From the beginning, the, Do the Department of Sound conducted its own oral history programme, usually involving visits to private homes to interview veterans, the first topic being pre-1919 aviation. To date, IWM have produced over 56,000 hours of professionally recorded, documented and preserved material. Much of this involves topics that are not covered elsewhere. The interviewing program was initially created with a preference for specifically defined, in, defined interviews for specifically defined subject areas, which resulted, for example, in what seemed like remarkable oversights, such as Sir Arthur Harris, i.e. Bomber Harris, uh, being stopped short before any discussion of the Second World War because the interviewer was only concentrating on the 1920s and 30s. Today, the museum generally takes a longer view. Though there remains scope for interviews relating to a specific, specific incident or campaign, as well as interviews including whole uh, careers or life stories, which is obviously how our Holocaust collections work, which started in the mid-1980s. The collection is used by a number of authors, teachers, scholars, families and researchers, as well as by linguists. Alongside this, it's been employed by actors preparing for relevant roles. Perhaps most notably for this forum, it's where Rafe Fiennes went to research playing the role of Amon Gert in Schindler's List. Of course, it's also used by the museum's internal staff, including the team who created the new Holocaust galleries. So to the new, to, to the new galleries. For the creation of the galleries, testimony served various purposes. As well as being used by curators as part of their research around objects and incidents displayed and discussed, as uh, many of the people who donated objects to us also gave oral testimony interviews, it was an important part of the physical design and intent of the project. For those of you who visited the previous Holocaust exhibition at the museum, you may remember that video testimony formed the backbone of that space providing a structural framework around which the whole interpretation was constructed. This is the previous exhibition here. This conceptual approach was determined by the curatorial team of that exhibition relatively early and was conceived as a way of insulating the project from any of the problems that arose from collecting physical objects. The museum's Holocaust-related collections were very small at that time and nowhere near substantial enough to support a whole exhibition on their own. These interviews were created under commission by Oak October Films and were cumulatively intended to cover as many different aspects of the history as possible. Where there were no objects, testimony would fill the gap. And where there were objects, testimony would play a supporting role. When we approached the development of the new galleries, we did so in a fundamentally different landscape to the one in which the previous Holocaust exhibition had created. First of all, we had a Holocaust collection at the museum, but also in the intervening period, an eye-watering volume of scholarship had emerged discussing all aspects of Holocaust representation and related subject areas. This included, of course, a substantial discourse around Holocaust testimony and Holocaust museology. Though overwhelming and at times intimidating, this did mean that we had far more pre-existing thought and theory to draw on than our colleagues, and indeed all others, all others creating Holocaust museums had over 20 or more years earlier. Our intention was to proceed and recede to this, but to do so in a way that was meaningful to visitors. We were and remain indebted to our academic advisory board for their help in, in helping us to uh, plot this course. While we were committed to using the pre-existing film testimony and have made public statements to that effect, 
we retained a completely open mind about what the nature of this usage should be. In many ways, the decision was ultimately made for us, or at least steered by a wider decision that was made early on regarding the interpretive framework for the entire space. When the First World War galleries were created at IWM, which preceded the Holocaust galleries by around seven years, they decided to use an approach that became known internally as contemporaneity. What this meant is that the objects used in the galleries and whatever form were all contemporaneous to the moment being addressed, and so was the information related to them. So in the section about the Battle of the Somme, for example, they used letters, diaries, photographs and objects from the summer and autumn of 1916, and not accounts that were created since then that put those events into a defined and determined context based on knowledge of the eventual outcome. The purpose of this was to reclaim the history from the teleological determinism that had consumed it within the popular imagination. While we were not obliged to retain this approach ourselves, we were very aware that a similar sort of teleological determinism surrounded the Holocaust in the popular imagination, and so saw it as a valuable and helpful approach. Contemporaneity, of course, ruled out the use of testimony throughout the main narrative spaces. And so after some consideration, we decided that this meant the most logical and natural position for it within the new galleries was in the final space, in an area that was intended to negotiate the lacuna between the historic past and the live and contemporary present. As this meant it would no longer be tethered to the historical narrative, it meant that we were no longer obliged to shape its content to serve a predetermined narrative function, so it could remain unedited and could run in its entirety. Everything could be retained. Every pause, hesitation, glitch, and silence. I had read about the importance of gaps in Holocaust testimony and work written by some of those in this room and was completely persuaded about the power of this approach. In order to experience it myself, very early on, I went into our own film archive and watched Roman Holter's testimony unabridged. Roman had a cold on the day that that filming took place, and the detail that had derived from that, invisible in the edited format in which it had previously been seen, made him seem and feel, to me, extraordinarily personal and somehow extraordinarily human. In the new design, visitors would enter this final space and sit in front of screens, encountering the individuals in front of them in the same way that I had encountered Roman. The only parts of the testimony that would be removed were those where it was clear that the moment or exchange was a private interaction with the interviewer and never intended for a wider audience. Once the intention had been established, we had to determine the practical means by which it should be achieved. Throughout the galleries, we gave a lot of thought to questions of affect and the ways in which opaque conceptual details steer visitors' response to content and space. There are many examples of this, but the one of them that's most relevant here is that throughout the galleries, where possible, individuals in photographs or film are displayed at eye level. The idea being that by encountering people in this way, visitors respond subconsciously differently to what they're seeing. This approach felt particularly important for film testimony, leading us to devise a means of horizontally mounting screens in front of seating so that visitors would sit directly opposite the individual who was speaking. Here, see an example of this here with Adita Klein-Smith. Here, as is the case throughout, however, we sought to modify claims about what the encounter represented. The experience is explicitly passive, not active. There is no interactivity and no suggestion that there is a live dialogue between the speaker and the viewer. Moreover, the design of the whole space is designed to reflect the process by which the fragments born out of the chaos of lived experience are reconceived within the formality and structure of the archival protest, uh, process. In this way, testimony is implicitly presented as object. This approach is embedded through a large projection screen you can see here, that it's the dominant feature in the room. This screen contains information about every single named individual in the galleries and some of the details that are known of what happened to them or not, as the case may be. Tragically, the majority were murdered. The piece has as its backdrop a material that's intended to reference archival paper. Quotes, objects, documents, photographs, or film related to the individual's appearance in the galleries appears alongside their name. The testimony screens use the same archival background, although they're supposed to, but they behave, long story. Um, uh, it was important for us that visitors understand that in this history, survival was not normative. And that, as Primo Levi powerfully expressed it in The Drowned and the Saved, those who lived and were able to express themselves later were, in his quote, an anomalous minority. This was intended not to diminish the testimonies in any respect, but to give them context, 
It also allowed us to engage with the interviewees and their experiences and perspectives as the individuals that they were, rather than as metonymic bearers of a broader history. On a different level, positioning the testimonies within this broader archival device also allowed us to negotiate the temporal space that had opened up between when they were originally filmed and the moment of their present use. The style of the composition of the shots, as well as the grading of the videos, the sartorial choices and hairstyles of the interviewees, all serves to position the footage in a slightly different time. So locating it as we have helps to acknowledge and somehow give permission for this difference. Using all of the film footage, by the small emissions that I've already described, means that there are now 30 hours of testimony in the galleries. In order, in order to ensure that this is played on a full cycle, rather than simply restarting at the beginning of each day, the underlying software has been programmed to display the content on a full loop, so it starts the next day where it finished the day before. We also made the decision that the existing interviews should be supplemented with new testimony, capturing the perspective of second and third generations. The idea was not to use these subsequent generations as ciphers for their parents' or grandparents' experiences, but to engage with questions of how growing up with the Holocaust as family history has shaped their own lives. I should say it's fantastic to see some of the people involved in those interviews here today. We were keen to include different combinations of people and to feature different uh, intergenerational perspectives. The original intention was to film these interviews in the same space that they were shown, thus bringing the audience and the speakers into the same room somehow. Unfortunately, this wasn't possible for technical reasons, but the interviews were shot in the galleries, in the opening space, in fact, thus ensuring it was clear that they were part of the gallery's own internal history. We wanted to be open and transparent about the nature of this process, and so the interviews were captured on three cameras simultaneously. One of these was a wide shot that captured the entire process from beginning to end, with all of the cameras, equipment, interviewers, interviewees, etc., visible. We had no preconceived outcomes for these new interviews and worked with an external oral historian to conduct them. The final conversations are an interesting and important addition to the space, though in a way that resists comprehensive explanation, which I would suggest is appropriate. While those interviewed were in some respects unrepresentative, insofar as they were all people known to us in some ways, and of course they were all conducted in English and people who uh, agreed to be interviewed, the range of perspectives that they offered were broad. Whether in the interviews filmed in the 1990s or those filmed for the project, from the visitor's perspective, entering the space to be confronted with people on screens talking at them is a radical departure from anything that's preceded it in the galleries. It's been very powerful to see how visitors respond to this. It strikes me that there is something disarming and profoundly affecting about literally being faced with the human identity of the genocide's traces in this final moment. Rather than the testimony demanding that the visitor be locked in a perpetual exchange whereby the historic past is rendered through the contemporaneous present of the interview, the interview is implicitly about the after and the way in which the past is mediated by the present. Furthermore, the presence of the interviewees in this moment is a potent and powerful reminder of a self-evident truth that is somehow far larger. As they talk and remember and pause and cough and sigh, and to all of the things that human do, humans do. They are here as they were then, just people. Thank you. Thank you, James. And spot on your 15 minutes, fantastic. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Madeline White. She's the curator of oral history at the British Library and at the same time, Deputy Director of Oral History Fieldwork for the Fieldwork Charity, National Life Stories. Madeline. Thank you. So my aim in this um, short presentation is to give a very brief overview of the library's collections of Holocaust testimony, looking at how as an archive and as a collecting institution, it has curated its collection of Holocaust testimonies, but also examining how other institutions and individuals have shaped the se separate projects and the testimonies contained within those projects. I'm then going to use one of our collections, The Living Memory of the Jewish Community, a National Life Stories collection, to, as a case study to examine in brief how the cultural context of a project is reflected in its content. And I hope that in the process that will prompt some questions or thoughts about what the British Library's holdings say about the testimonial landscape in Britain. 
So to give a very, very brief overview of the Holocaust testimony collections at the library, the first thing to note is that the collections are made up of several separate projects, each conducted by an independent organization or individual, with the material then being deposited at the British Library, which assumes responsibility for the care of the material and for providing access to it as the archival repository. The library doesn't have its own dedicated program of interviewing Holocaust survivors, but the National Life Stories project I'll talk about shortly comes close to that. The collections vary in their size and in their scope from large collections of more than 150 interviews, including the living memory of the Jewish community, the British Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies, which was an affiliate project of the Fortunoff Archive, and the Holocaust Survivors Centre's own project, through to smaller collections, such as those recorded by Herbert Levy, the CBF, and Anton Gill, the latter two of which were small collections of interviews conducted as research for monographs on the Holocaust. Most of the interviews, the majority of all of these interviews were recorded in the 1980s and the 1990s with a small number of ad hoc interviews added to some of those collections a bit later than that. And the majority of them, with the exception of the British Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies, are audio-only interviews. The other thing to note is that these collections of Holocaust testimony sit alongside other oral history collections at the British Library, which document Jewish experience in Britain from a all manner of different lenses and approaches, including collections from the London Museum of Jewish Life, the Chief Rabbi's Office, and the Sephardi Voices Project. So again, another very brief overview of National Life Stories, which is an independent charitable trust with expertise in oral history fieldwork, which operates out of the British Library, but is independently um, run and financed. And the library archives all of the interviews that National Life Stories produced. It was founded as the National Life Story Collection by sociologist and oral historian Paul Thompson and historian Asa Briggs in 1987, with the aim to record the first-hand experiences of as wide a cross-section of present-day society as possible. The Living Memory of the Jewish Community was its third project, launched in 1988, a year after NLS was founded, and it followed two projects on leaders of national life and um, City Lives, which interviewed people who work in the city. And today it sits alongside all manner of oral history collections and projects which uh, collect life stories from people from a wide range of professions, people who work in industry, artists, authors, people who work in the theatre um, as part of the National Life Story Collection. NLS is known in the oral history world in the UK for pioneering the long life story methodology, by which I mean long interviews which are often two, three, four times as long as other or types of oral history interviews, typically in excess of eight, nine, ten hours sometimes. Um, and that is a methodology that I know has resonances in the Holocaust testimony world, where people or projects recognize the value of interviewing survivors about their pre-war and their post-war lives. The first thing to note in the context of thinking about the living memory of the Jewish community, or LMJC as I'll call it for short, is that... The creation and therefore the work of national life stories has its origins in the field of oral history, not in Holocaust studies, in war memory, or even specifically in the Jewish community, which is where a lot of, or if not the majority of Holocaust testimony projects come from. So it has a different origin, a different methodology, and a different reason for doing the work that it does. On which note, NLS did not set out initially to interview Holocaust survivors. The genesis of the idea comes from elsewhere, influenced by wider conversations in fields of oral history and British social history, which shaped thinking about what a national life story collection should include. The oral history movement in the UK was gaining ground around this time, driven largely by um, a history from below approach that was very interested in recording the voices of individuals who were otherwise absent from the historical record, including immigrants, the working class, and other marginalised groups. This is notable context because it's in quite stark contrast to the development of the oral history movement elsewhere in the world, notably in the US, where oral history was developing at a similar time, but driven by an interest in interviewing elite members of society. On which note, there were many other projects underway in the oral history community in the UK at this time, interviewing members of the Jewish community, but not specifically Holocaust survivors or interviewing specifically about the Holocaust. In the context of which the living memory of the Jewish community was conceived. So I've included on this slide a quote from Jennifer Wingate, who is an NLS trustee and a longtime supporter of National Life Stories, 
And this quote is taken from an interview that Jennifer recorded in conversation with the founder of NLS, Paul Thompson, in which they discussed the origins of LMJC. And I'm not going to read it out, but to summarize what Jennifer's talking about in this quote, the idea initially was a project interviewing immigrants. So looking at how people who were born outside the UK and had chosen to make the UK their home fit into that idea of national life and British national life, how they experienced life in Britain. And it was when it was realized that as an idea for an oral history project that was quite unwieldy and difficult to actually undertake, that the decision was made to focus on the Jewish community. At which time, um, and this has already been mentioned today, the Remembering for the Future conference that Elizabeth Maxwell hosted in Oxford took place. And it was at that time that Jennifer Wingate and Les recognized that there was value in focusing this project specifically on Holocaust survivors. So you can see how the LMJC project occurs at a convergence between developments in oral history practice in the UK, as well as developments in British National War memory and in Holocaust memory. Um, those developments are seen quite starkly in the Imperial War Museum's own approach to collecting Holocaust testimony too. And the result is a project that is one of the earliest collections of Holocaust oral testimony created in the UK, but which has a scope that is broader than the Holocaust. What this looks like in practice is a collection which had a selection process or some criteria for selecting who would be interviewed. Um, and this in process of interview selection drew largely from a pool of Holocaust survivors with the names gathered initially at the Oxford Remembering for the Future conference, but which took into account other factors. So the individuals who participated needed to be British residents. Um, because it's part of a national life story collection, so this was not a project that interviewed beyond the UK. They needed to some extent identify as Jewish, and that criteria was really there to focus the collection on the living memory of the Jewish community and not on other groups persecuted by the Nazis. Thirdly, they were to be born outside the UK, and that's a criteria that was applied in large, but not entirely. Um, it, there were a few interviews with uh, people who were born in the UK, which I'll explain in a moment. But again, the idea was to keep that focus on uh, people who had emigrated, into, immigra emigrated from Europe into the UK. And the fourth criteria was that they had not previously been interviewed. And at the time, that pretty much meant they hadn't been interviewed by the Imperial War Museum. This kept the definition of survivor very broad. So the Holocaust experiences that are contained within the collection range from people who emigrated out of Europe before 1939, refugees, young people who came on the kinder transport, to camp survivors, those who survived the war in hiding, displaced persons, and so on. The collection also includes a small number of members of the British Jewish community who were born in the UK and lived here during the war, many of whom describe their experiences as Jewish people living on the home front or as members of the armed forces, and the experiences of family members who were trapped in Nazi-occupied Europe. There are also 35 interviews in the collection with the children of Holocaust survivors. Okay. These are long life story interviews that are often significantly longer than those found in other testimony collections, uh, which collect Holocaust testimonies, even those which recognize the value of asking survivors about their pre- and post-war lives. And that's because of the long life story methodology that's been pioneered by National Life Stories and which continues through to its interview projects today. And just to give you a rough idea of what that means, um, the average LMJC interview is four hours long, with the longest interviews lasting for more than 10 hours. Um, and the USC Shoah Foundation Visual History Archive states its own average is a little over two hours. And this means that there is extensive coverage of pre-war life in both the UK and Europe, as well as detailed exploration of British Jewish life in the post-war period. So these interviews have a huge application for all manner of different research queries and um, cultural projects and avenues for people to explore beyond just the Holocaust itself. Uh, but this also highlights how context in this case, the social context, academic context, cultural context, determines the methodology of this particular oral history project and all oral history projects, which in turn shapes how these interviews record, filter, or transmit the history they document. And for that reason, LMJC isn't really categorized as a Holocaust oral testimony project in the context of the BL's collections, because on one level it is one of national life stories or history projects, which forms part of the tapestry of British national life that NLS has been stitching together over the last 36 years. 
On another is one of many hundreds of oral history projects documenting modern history that are now archived at the British Library, which themselves sit alongside millions of other sound recordings, books, documents, and paraphernalia that document UK and world history from a British perspective. Finally, I'd like to talk about our recently relaunched Voices of the Holocaust website, which was launched earlier this year thanks to funding from the National Ottery Heritage Fund as part of Unlocking Our Sound Heritage. It's an updated and refreshed version of the previous website, which was launched in 2002, adding new content from all our collections, including those recently digitized by Unlocking Our Sound Heritage. And the website itself is based on an educational cassette pack resource created by Rob Perks and Carrie Supple in 1993. One of the key emphasis of the website in its new iteration is a focus on telling the history of the Holocaust through the experiences of those who found refuge in Britain, acknowledging that the library's collections have a particular strength in their ability to tell the story of Britain's involvement in the Holocaust and its reception and treatment of immigrants, refugees and displaced persons. It also acknowledges for the first time explicitly the limitations of these collections and their ability to tell the story or the history of the Holocaust, which means it, the collections can only tell the story of those people that Britain allowed in, not the many people who were turned away. It can only tell the story of those who settled here, not those who emigrated onwards. It, they can only tell the story of those who wanted to be interviewed and those who could be interviewed those who felt able to speak about their experiences and were able to articulate them in, in English, which is often a second or third or even fourth language for many people. They can also only tell the stories of those who had access to the projects we've archived, which were naturally limited themselves by geography, funding, time, resource limitations. And of course, they can only tell the history of the Holocaust from the perspective of those who survived. So when thinking about how we move forward with these vast and undeniably important collections of testimony, I think it is pertinent to examine all testimony collections in this way to consider, in light of their cultural context, what stories they can tell, as well as those that they cannot. Thank you. So James Gilmore is the oral history curator at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. So without further ado, James. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm honored to be here as the last speaker uh, among colleagues from uh, so many respected oral testimony, archi oral testimony archives. Um, this is my first time in London, so it's a particularly special experience for me. Um, the, the only thing is that when I told my daughters, who are 18 and 20 and very into fashion, that I would be coming here, they just had two questions. Uh, how large would the suitcase be that I'm taking? <laughs> and should they text me or email me their, uh, the items that they want me to bring home to them? <laughs> um, I'd like to share with you uh, an overview of the ongoing development of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's Jeff and Toby Herr Oral History Archive and the role that oral testimonies play among other primary sources in the museum's collection. For over 30 years, the museum's oral history program has been building a diverse collection of, oral, of Holocaust testimonies featuring the experiences of Jewish survivors, members of the Roma and Sinti community, Jehovah's Witnesses, political prisoners, members of the LGBTQ plus community, individuals who were persecuted under Nazi racial hygiene policy, such as the deaf and hard of hearing, and um, other groups who were targeted by the Nazis and their collaborators. The collection also contains interviews with liberators, rescuers, resistance fighters, relief workers, journalists, and post-war prosecutors. For instance, we, we have several interviews with the late Benjamin Ferenz. Furthermore, the collection includes interviews with witnesses and bystanders, as well as a small number of collaborators and perpetrators. Though these categories, such as witness, collaborator, are not always so bounded or, or straightforward. Um, I think it's similar to what um, Joanna uh, presented earlier when she talked about a, a rescuer who also exploited or, or abused uh, the, the people that she rescued. Three key programs have contributed to the building of the museum's oral history archive. One, museum productions, mainly with survivors in North America. Two, 
museum productions with survivors and witnesses throughout Europe and into Central Asia, and three, the acquisition of existing collections held in private hands or other archival repositories across the globe. I'll say a little bit about each. Since 1989, the museum has been producing interviews with survivors and eyewitnesses in North America as part of its mission to document and preserve primary source material that will allow future generations of students, historians, uh, teachers, um, and filmmakers to learn in intimate detail from a broad range of individuals who experienced or witnessed the genocidal policies and crimes of the Nazis and their collaborators. Our interviews have typically, typically focused on the entire life story of an eyewitness, from their earliest memories to where they settled post-war and where they are today. And as I'm sure many of you have um, seen, whatever is happening at the present uh, in terms of geopolitics often enter enters the conversation. Until recently, these interviews typically took place in an interviewee's home, requiring several hours of setup for recording with a two-person camera crew and an interviewer. The COVID-19 pandemic pr prompted the museum to quickly reorient its pr approach, switching from in-person production to remote interviewing through Zoom and other conferencing platforms. In contrast to our expectation that production capacity would diminish with lockdowns and stay-at-home orders, we were pleased to discover that through remote interviewing, interviewing, we could reach more survivors than ever before. The remote interview process also made it possible to del delve deeper into survivor stories by following up with interviewees at their convenience, and it led to longer and more detailed testimonies. We were also able to take advantage of built-in automated transcription and other features to increase the discoverability of these interviews uh, for researchers. We were especially pleased and surprised to discover that our interviewees had already had experience with using these methods of communication with their loved ones. So the learning curve was really on our end in terms of how to um, produce a, a decent interview. While some in-person interviewing in the United States will return in the near future, we will continue with this remote model moving forward since our main US-based interviewer no longer has to be limited by travel, funding, or geography. While the majority of our interviews in the, in the United States have been conducted in English, it may be of interest to note that two weeks ago, we conducted our very first interview in American Sign Language with a woman in New York named Ruth Stern. The interview grew out of a project to address a significant gap in our collection in regard to the deaf Holocaust experience. In 2017, we began, we began reaching out to deaf survivors and their descendants to document their experiences through artifacts, documents, and signed testimonies. Uh, for the interview with Mrs. Stern, we consulted with deaf scholars uh, to learn the best way to interview a deaf person, which includes how to light a dominant signing hand, how to frame the interviewee so that, that both their hands are visible, how to conduct an interview, um, with, or how to conduct an interview with the interviewer on screen so that the questions can be seen and by, uh, understood by deaf audiences, and how to um, use post-production voiceover so that both deaf and hearing audiences can access the interview. During the past decade, we've also developed some other initiatives to, um, to address similar gaps in our collection. Uh, for example, we had very few testimonies from the uh, Orthodox or the ultra-Orthodox community um, until we partnered with an organization in New York um, to, to record those stories. And I think it was similar to what um, Rosalind uh, discussed. Um, we, we continue to look to, uh, at filling other gaps in our collection while eyewitnesses um, and eyewitness generation is still available to tell its own story. In the late 1990s, we expanded our scope to include other types of eyewitnesses whose testimonies add valuable context and nuance to survivor stories. We've been producing interviews throughout Europe and into Central Asia with individuals who are not victim, direct victims of Nazi persecution, but might instead be grouped under the umbrella term of witness. And this includes onlookers or bystanders, collaborators, um, and in a few cases, perpetrators. Though, as I mentioned earlier, such terms as bystander, witness, um, collaborator aren't always mutually exclusive, and, and we don't use those descriptors um, in our catalog. Many of, our, uh, of these witnesses are still living in the towns and villages at the time of these interviews um, from which their Jewish neighbors were deported or, or, or murdered nearby, and they've retained vivid memories of what they saw or, or even participated in. We've produced interviews in over 30 countries, among which include France, Germany, Netherlands, Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, Belarus, Russia, Kazakhstan, Hungary, Moldova, Latvia, 
uh, and countries in the former Yugoslavia. And we're still actively involved in looking for eyewitnesses across a broad geographical landscape. Most recently, a, a team traveled to, through Albania to record or oral histories related to more than 2,000 Jews who sought refuge there. They interviewed more than a dozen eyewitnesses whose families aided or rescued Jewish refugees. At the same time, we had another team in Italy, um, a country which offers uh, a valuable opportunity for primary source um, material, given that it experienced one of the longest fascist regime, regimes in pre-war Europe. The interaction of persecuted Jews and native resistance movements had not been well documented uh, in our collection. We've also been present in sorry, European transit countries where emigrants passed through seeking safety before and during the war, including Spain and Portugal. Um, interviews from these countries have provided essential context for understanding the rise of Nazism and the per persecution of Jews and other minority groups throughout the European continent and the many ways in which local authorita authoritarian governments function both in isolation from and in tandem with other repress re repressive regimes. We continue to seek testimonies elsewhere in the world from individuals whose lives intersected with the Holocaust, such as North Africa, Mexico, and countries in, uh, throughout South America. Along with museum productions, my fellow curators and I have looked to, to repositories across the globe to acquire existing testimonies. As I think everyone here is well aware, many oral history collections are still widely held in private hands and in, um, or in small archives that lack the resources to preserve these materials in perpetuity on cloud-based servers or, or, or hardware storage systems. Uh, for over 30 years, we've endeavored to build a collection of record on the Holocaust by acquiring as much individual, uh, as much audiovisual testimony as possible from libraries, filmmakers, universities, community organizations, uh, private hands, and uh, smaller archival repositories. Likewise, the museum has partnered with larger, uh, well-established institutions to acquire copies of their collections to share with, with audiences in both exhibitions and through our online catalog. These partnerships have been vital to building uh, the collection of record and to making stories of eyewitnesses accessible to global audiences for education, research, filmmaking, exhibitions, and memorialization. Uh, some, of the con uh, some examples of content we've recently acquired include interviews with survivors of Sobibor, uh, European refugees who fought as part of the Allied forces, journalists who were present at the Nuremberg trials, and survivors who settled in South, South America. And we're now in the process of acquiring a large collection of interviews um, with survivors who lived through both Nazism and communism, and at the time of the interviews, um, still struggled with their daily lives in remote areas of Eastern Europe. Um, we're also working with uh, Brandeis University to, to acquire their oral history collection, which dates back to the early 1970s and has never been digitized nor listened to since then. Now, it's important to mention that in addition to producing and acquiring oral testimonies, we're still active, we're actively collecting artifacts, documents, photographs, films, and music um, for, from the pre-war, wartime, and immediate post-war period so that um, we can build, preserve, and make accessible one of the world's for, most comprehensive collections of materials and documentation on the Holocaust. These, art, art, these artifacts across formats frequently add nuance to oral testimonies and provide a richer re representation and further contextualizes the stories that survivors tell. Three minutes, perfect. Um, one of the unique aspects of our oral history collection is that with digitization, we've made most of it, uh, about 90%, available to global audiences through our online collection search. Interviews can be viewed or listened to in full, and many are discoverable through keyword searches and summaries and subject headings in our catalog, uh, though we still have a lot of cataloging to do. Um, we neither charge for copies nor, um, nor, nor for use of the material um, in our collection. Uh, but one of the true values is that I, I would say at least once a month, someone writes us to say that they just discovered that their grandmother or grandfather gave their testimony, and they found it through our website or, or just by Googling their grandparents' name and you know, this is the first time they're hearing their grandmother's voice in 20 years. And, and you can just imagine, you know, I'm sure you experience, you know, what type of sort of validity that, that, that brings. Um, to date, we have around 30,000 interviews in our Jeff and Toby Hur oral history archive. And we offer on-site access to the extensive USC Shoah Foundation uh, visual history archive and Yale's Fortune Off archive. Um, we acquire around uh, 1,000 interviews per year through both production and acquisition, 
And um, there's a range of interviews, from, from professional uh, uh, interviews produced by oral historians to very you know, amateur uh, family-recorded interviews to very, very amateur interviews with very you know, peculiar uh, methodology. Uh, but, but I think what the point is, all of these interviews, what, what they have in common is they record stories that would otherwise be lost to history. Um, I'd, I'd like to just conclude um, on this overview on a slightly more personal note when, um, by sharing a quote that I, that I often think about when, when I reflect on what it means on a personal level to, 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 to preserve someone's oral testimony. Um, in, in Zahava Stessel's 1995 interview, she states, she states with this devastating simplicity, the Holocaust, it's constant. We were never really liberated from it. And my hope is that for survivors like, Zah like Zahava, who, who share their most intimate memories of trauma and, and loss, telling their story on record is a transformative experience that in some way helps unburden them, uh, as, as I think some survivors have, have already described the experience. Um, moreover, I, I hope survivors are aware that their testimonies are, are invaluable tools for teaching about the Holocaust and for combating Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism, and that their testimonies are even more precious to family members. I'm grateful to be here among all of you fellow stewards of memory whose work it is to safeguard the truth and to pre preserve these precious resources for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. We've got just a few minutes, about uh, eight, nine minutes, in fact, eight minutes, I should say, for some questions. Have we got the microphones at the ready? Um, are there any questions to the panel? One right at the back there, actually. If we've got any roving mics. Have we got a roving mic, apart from myself? Um, can't see any roving mics coming your way. Yes? You can, you can yell. OK, thank you. I'd love to repeat that question, but I am a little bit hard of hearing, so I really didn't hear it. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> can you just, just ask, ask the question bit? Sorry. Yes. Um, so I'm from Gathering the Voices. Um, we are a, an archive, a digital archive based in Scotland, and the British Library has archived our um, archive for a number of years, which has been fantastic, and they've updated it every six months. My question is, is it linking at all to your new material to do with the Holocaust? Thank you. Yes? Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Um, do you mean the Voices of the Holocaust work I was talking about at the end? Okay, it's a good question, and um, I need to make a distinction between the interviews that we archive and um, what you're talking about, which is the UK Web Archive, which operates out of the British Library. So what I didn't even have a chance to touch upon here is the multitude of websites and other web resources that are archived by the UK Web Archive, which is hosted by the British Library, which in itself is an archive of both testimony, but also of Holocaust memory and of the product of Holocaust memory in a digital space. So the short answer is no, it doesn't link into the Voices of the Holocaust web resource because that resource specifically uses audio clips from the interviews that we have archived um, physically at the library, but um, it does feature in the UK web archive. And I think there's definitely scope to link some of these digital websites up in some way, and perhaps that's something that needs to feed into the conversation about the, uh, the UK portal, about linking up resources, um, as well as the collections that they, they draw from. Second question? Here it is. Thanks. Um, I'd like to ask if the panelists could say something about how you see Holocaust memory fitting in with wokeness, because whether you like wokeness or not, it's very powerful, and I wonder how you think Holocaust memory fits in with that. I know it's a bit of a stupid question, but it's a 
you know, it's it's driving a lot of interest on memory and how we retell, especially Britain's past, and uh, I think it's relevant. I mean, I think one of the one of the simplest truths about history is that whilst it's about what happened in the past, it's always remade in the present. So inevitably, history is always responding to contemporaneous or contemporary themes of thought. I think, uh, I mean, obviously, wokeness, we're still kind of trying to figure out what that means culturally, I think, and it's obviously enmeshed in a load of other issues which are very difficult for us and very challenging, frankly, as an institution to do with the, the unspoken culture wars, as you can probably imagine, being the Imperial War Museum, that's quite quite difficult. Um, but I think, so, so the short answer to that is, I think for now we don't know, but I think I would like to think, and I would like to be optimistic in this respect, that it will actually start to sort of positively um, inform the way that we think about things. I think we're that, seeing that already, to be honest with you. I think my sense of working at the institution that I do work at, having been there now for a short period of time, but nowhere near as long as a lot of other people have, is that there is a very um, genuine intention and aspiration to be better at things that we haven't necessarily perhaps been historically the best at. And so I think if, if wokeness becomes part of that, in its kind of purest form, in its distilled form of being self-aware and thinking about um, thinking about things in a more self-critical and self-aware way, then I, then I think actually maybe that will feed into these things. The difficult thing is obviously this perennial issue, which we're constantly running up against, is how you reconcile um, contemporary attitudes with attitudes which are embedded in historical content. You know, that, and that's, that's a slightly more difficult thing to... We find it, it's a completely different subject, but we find it, for example, with historic captioning. You know, some of the way that captions and objects were, have been described historically within our collections are absolutely not the way that anyone would choose to describe them now. But that's the way that the contemporary uh, or contemporaneous curatorial team curated it. So what do you do with that? How, 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 do, you, how do you acknowledge that, but also not let it go for nothing. You, wouldn't, you don't say that's okay, but, but at the same time you have to kind of work with it. So I think that's all part of the same issue. So that's quite a second make issue. I don't have much else to add other than that last point's a really good point about the way that things are catalogued and also not just the way that things are catalogued by the people who put them into the catalogue, but also the language that people use to talk about their own experiences and how that in itself is contextual and can, you know, the, the language that someone used to describe themselves in testimony in the 1980s or to describe the people around them or to describe the events they experienced might not be recognised as appropriate or woke or whatever other term you want to use in the, in the current um, period in which someone is viewing those testimonies so I think that's uh, a question that we need to bear in mind and consider how to navigate okay we've got time for one more question I'm afraid um, oh gosh it's difficult to to choose um, there's a lady here in the second row can we pass the mic along thank you um, <clears throat> I wanted to put in a plea for transcripts. Um, I'm about to write um, a family memoir, and um, there's no family for me to ask, so I'm relying on other people's memoirs. And you need to have an accurate um, uh, account of the interview. And if it's only audio, um, it's really quite difficult. Um, at least I find it difficult. I, th I think I can mention something. Um, at the museum, we um, are pilot piloting a project to use automated transcription. Um, we've done uh, several hundred interviews so far with this online software. It's pretty good. It's not perfect. <laughs> it still requires you know human beings to look over terms. It interprets names in a very odd way. But it's not bad as a finding aid. If someone's doing a keyword search on a town or a place or an event, um, we really do want researchers and scholars and students to listen and watch the full interviews because transcripts are notoriously you know, inaccurate. Uh, but at the same time, transcripts can be used to define these interviews. So I think I, I, there's great hope for this automated type of work to be done in the future. And I think it's getting better with non-English languages. Right now, it's, it's pretty, pretty, it's decent with English language, except for people with very, very thick accents or, uh, um, yeah, I imagine that other organizations are still experimenting with it. Yeah, I mean, I was going to mention it in the talk, but I didn't for the sake of time. But we, when I mentioned we've got 30 hours of 
testimony in the galleries, that meant that somebody had to sit down and transcribe 30 hours of video, which I didn't think about when we came up with the concept. Because as you say, we worked with the automated uh, software to a point, but it's, it's tricky, it's massively labor intensive to get it. Um, I completely agree with you. I think it's, re you know, it's obviously really useful and important. The other thing which we, the, the kind of ethical question which we run up against with it is what you transcribe. We ended up within the galleries trying to transcribe every audible fragment of what was said because we felt that that was important because of the repetitions and the ums and the ers and the sights. We tried to transcribe all of that, but that's obviously a whole other dimension that needs to be considered when you're thinking about transcription, what exactly it is that you're seeking to transcribe. Right, well, I'm afraid our time, time is up. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this session as much as I have and uh, would like to thank our distinguished delegates, including our fair. Thank you very much indeed for your presentation. And also to thank, as, as the final speaker today, AGR and all the other organisers for this fabulous day. But you will really now have to race down to the cloakrooms and, you know, get out of the building. So see you all tomorrow.